The recent interactions between Boris Johnson and his current inner core within leadership and also his interaction with Dominic Cummings, who was very much a key advisor who, having been very in, is now very out. Um, and the fact that Dominic Cummings has then been so strongly critical of Matt Hancock, who is still currently much more in than he is. All these um, shenanigans, these tension points, are these posturings of who is near to the key man, they are very much par for the course within political life, not just in the UK, but in all circumstance. But sadly, they are also very true to humanity. And spirituality is not necessarily devoid of this jostling for power and influence. And the passage that we look at today as we continue to journey with our emphasis on effective discipleship here at Whetstone, as we look at Matthew 20 and verses 20 through to 28, uh, we see very much the same tension points as two key individuals seek to kind of push themselves forward um, much at the dismay of others within the discipleship group. We're going to think about this passage under four related areas and first of all I would want to draw your attention to an expectation of significance particularly looking at verses 20 and 21. Matthew records that the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus um, with her sons and kneeling down asked a favour of him. We read in Mark chapter 10 and verse 35 that the sons initiate this request but it's quite clear here in Matthew that effectively the mother is doing it on their behalf and so clearly we can't just blame her as being a pushy mother who's trying to push her boys to the front of the queue and have a heightened influence on events and being much closer to Jesus because really the boys James and John are the drivers in this and the account in Mark's gospel. Just as we conclude this observation well who is this woman? Well she is the mother of James and John Zebedee's boys Zebedee's sons. Um, it is interesting because it's sometimes postulated that she might have been also Mary's sister, referred to in John 19 and verse 25. She's clearly mentioned in Matthew 27 and verse 56 at um, a key point in Jesus's life. And so she certainly was within the immediate core of women who identified and supported Jesus's ministry. You do get the impression, again, there are the 12 there is the wider grouping of disciples, the 70 or 72, and also a group of supportive women, to some extent some who were financially supporting Jesus's ministry. So it's possible that she was uh, Mary's sister called Salome. Um, and if that is the case, interestingly, then James and John become Jesus's cousins. And so there is a family relationship which perhaps heightens the push for James and John to be recognised as his inner core. Now, we've already seen in the Gospels, in this Gospel, chapter 17 and verse 1, at the time of the Transfiguration, that Peter, James and John were, if you like, a triumvirate, an inner core within the Twelve. We also read in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 22 that Peter had, in a way, queered his pitch by um, rebuking Jesus when <coughs> Jesus says that he's going to have to suffer and die. And there are those very strong words of rebuke to Peter that um, Satan is speaking through him. It might even be that this is now the bid for the two to eclipse the other person in the triumvirate who seems to have now um, blotted his copybook and perhaps maybe because they're relatives also of Jesus as cousins, they feel that they have the ultimate right to be 
alongside Jesus in his responsibility. The background to all of this is laid out in Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28, where he says, Truly I tell you at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man, that's talking about himself, sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, having heard those words, James and John are saying, okay, that's great. Peter's blown himself up. The rest of them are not so significant. We want to be in the positions of responsibility on the, the left and on the right. And of course, the right was the ultimate position of responsibility. What they are not remembering is Jesus's comments, for example, in verse 30 of Matthew 19, but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. And again in verse 16 of this chapter, so the last will be first and the first will be last. In other words, the ordering may well have some surprises, but still they're putting their pitch in and they're saying, OK, Jesus, we want to be right there alongside you. It could sound like being supportive, almost like um, the two men holding up Moses's hands in battle in the Old Testament. But that was much more for the glory of God and for the prevailing of God's people. Here, this seems to be more naked self-advancement. And again, it would be good to think that church life uh, doesn't have any examples of this, but sadly it does. Secondly, then, an expectation of suffering. So, interestingly, Jesus um, responds to their request in verse 21 grant uh, this is the request through the mother grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom and he rightly says you don't know what you're asking for can you drink the cup that i'm going to drink now that seems to us a very strange comment it is a symbolic a metaphorical comment because what he's talking about is a cup being an experience of suffering. <clears throat> so, for example, in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 17, Isaiah talks about the cup of suffering. And of course, classically, even later in this gospel, Jesus talks about the cup of suffering that he will experience. And he, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew 26 and verse 39, says, Please, Lord, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so Jesus says, OK, right, if you're really up for this level of responsibility, what you've got to understand is this level of responsibility will involve suffering. It's not just about prestige. It's a timely reminder that if you're signing up for significance in the kingdom of God and following the suffering servant, who is Jesus Christ, then actually having preeminence, having dominance, will have a very different shape from what is offered in the world. Now they immediately answer, yes we can, you know, we, we can cope with this suffering. And so Jesus responds in verse 23, well, yes indeed you will drink from that cup. Even within the gospel record, it is recorded that James is murdered um, by King Herod in a persecution in Acts chapter 12 and verse 2. John later, we understand, dies in his bed, but still experienced a time of persecution. And of course, he is exiled on the island of Patmos, where he receives the vision that is the substance of the book of Revelation. So he certainly still suffered, even if he didn't die a martyr's death. But then Jesus reminds them gently but firmly that the places that they're applying for on the right, on the left, these places are not even for him to fully grant because we're not at that stage yet. Jesus has not yet died. He's not yet been glorified through the resurrection and the ascension, but the Father will grant those in his own time. And of course, in verse 24, we notice that the 10 who were listening on to this, the other 10 disciples, are indignant. Are they indignant the passage doesn't spell out simply because they feel um, 
who are these guys to push themselves forward and don't they realize that this is not how this all works or is it possibly and more cynically but accurately the case that they are indignant because they're saying well they're trying to get in and by trying to get in with Jesus they're pushing us out clearly there is a challenge here to recognize that in the kingdom of God and in Christian service higher levels of responsibility definitely involve higher levels of cost higher levels of pain possibly even giving up your life in martyrdom and so Jesus says yes it's a good thing to aspire to spiritual responsibility but do remember what you're asking for many people aspire to be pastors to be evangelists to be apostles um, and there is some glorious stuff within Christian leadership but sometimes also great pain and agony as you follow the example of Jesus who suffered and died for us continuing this theme and then we look thirdly at an example of superiority in verse 25 so then Jesus addresses <coughs> the directly the situation and he challenges them with an example of how things can be different in the world he says you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them now clearly Jesus is talking about the Roman civil and military authorities that were in control of Israel at this particular time he's saying listen and he uses two terms they lord it over them and they exercise authority over them we see examples of this even within the Gospels so Pontius Pilate in his later discussion with Jesus in John chapter 19 and verse 10 he says don't you realize that I have authority similar word to release you or to condemn you and then the Roman centurion in Luke chapter 7 and verse 8 in a very different context where he's engaging in a healing experience uh, in regard to um, his household with Jesus but he says look I'm a man of authority and I tell people to go and I tell people to come and they just do this so these examples are even borne out in the experience of the Jewish culture of the time and of course there were some also Jewish leaders not least Herod and his court who operated in a similar manner and of course sometimes obviously the Jewish ruling council the Sanhedrin were guilty of similar sorts of behavior now interestingly Jesus is not directly saying that this is unspiritual that this is immoral but what he is saying by inference is that this is not the way of the kingdom of God it is the way of the world I think that fundamentally challenges about how power operates within church life. If you are granted responsibility and implicit power within that, how do you exercise that? And so for ministers and church leaders, if they carry themselves with a sense of arrogance and self-importance, I remember um, a former colleague in a previous church went to a uh, conference for larger churches within our denomination and I simply said to her afterwards I said how did you find it and she said well it was an interesting conference but it was also characterized by a collision of egos and I found that quite disturbing um, but almost if you're leading a larger church that in, entitles you perhaps even to have a, a larger sense of ego and self-importance clearly carrying ourselves with that level of evident authority and power um, is a is a very much a worldly thing but is Jesus is saying is not part of discipleship I've known ministers sometimes want to pull rank you know I am your minister I am your leader as if that is therefore a precursor I am over you so you must do what I say and what I do that sort of approach to discipleship has no legitimacy in the words expressed in this portion of scripture 
Fourthly and lastly, an example of servanthood. These very important words in verses 26 to 28. Not so with you, says Jesus. In other words, other people throw their weight around. You must never throw your weight around. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Again, it's the topsy-turviness of the kingdom of God, that to be exalted, you must be humbled. This is a constant theme. It's expressed a lot in the Old Testament, but also strongly in the New Testament. Verse 27, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. The first word is a servant, from which we get the word deacon, but this is an even stronger term from which we get the word, um, which is doulos in Greek, which is effectively the word for slave. So it's, you should be a servant, but even more than a servant, you should actually be a slave. It's as almost as if you have no individual rights. You know, you should be <coughs> somebody who gives of themselves fully and completely to others. And then he says, why? Because that is the way that I operate. Just as the Son of Man, talking about himself, it's a messianic title from Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14, the special one who will come as the servant of God, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The words here are a clear echo of the book of Isaiah. And that famous song of the suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 53 concludes in the verse uh, verse 12 therefore I will give him that's the suffering servant a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and became and made intercession for the transgressors that's very important in understanding the word here many Many doesn't here mean a lot. So being a ransom, a payment effectively for somebody who was a traitor, somebody who was a criminal. Um, but paying that ransom for a number of those who have failed and won God's disapproval as a result. But the many is the community. It is an inclusive term. And so what is meant here is that the Son of Man gave his life as a ransom for the whole community and so the the challenge here is recognizing that Jesus is saying my example is to humble myself to become a servant even to be obedient to death and thereby releasing blessing into others and that should be the model that you follow here at Weston we've been doing an evening series in Philippians and just a few weeks ago we were looking at the earlier part of Philippians chapter 2 which says very much the same thing Paul talks about how Jesus did not consider equality with God with God the Father something to be grasped snatched you know but instead he was willing to become like a servant and not just a servant but to become even obedient to death and even the horror of the death on the cross, that therefore then God would exalt him. And the context is to challenge the church, not just with the wonder of what Christ has done for them in salvation, but his example, Jesus' example of humility, is commended to a church where there were two female, we presume leaders, referred to in chapter 4, who were at loggerheads with each other. And a number of people on the fringes or within the church in chapter 3, who were asserting that their spirituality put them in another league. That's where the rubber hits the road. Jesus is saying, my example to you is I am pouring myself out. So the converse to jostling, um, to power assertion and power games, which are often cripplingly evident in church life. The complete contrast to this, Jesus is saying, is instead not to want to lord it over people or exercise authority, but to be a humble, unassuming servant who pours out their lives for the benefit and the blessing of others. May that be true for us that we will indeed be Christ-like, humble, unassuming people who simply serve rather than trying to be
the people who are currying for position, jostling for position, trying to have influence within our communities. May we instead be people who just simply want to pour out love to others and be a blessing.